Good morning, and welcome to Birmingham Unitarian Church. I'm the Reverend Mandy Beal. I'm this congregation's senior minister. I'm joined in worship leadership this morning by worship associate Tom Raffle and our accompanist, Forrest Howell. We also have a lot of tech support from our communications coordinator, Sarah Constantakis, and our Zoom greeter, Drika DeGraff. BUC is a spiritual home for all people of goodwill. We believe in justice and hospitality, and we have earned such designations from the Unitarian Universalist Association. We are a welcoming congregation, and that is a term that means that we are intentionally inclusive of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer individuals and their families. We are also a green sanctuary congregation, which means that we have educated ourselves and we take action to protect our environment. Our commitment to both of these programs was renewed this year. And although there is no such designation for racial justice work, we are deeply committed to that work as well. Our worship services are hosted here on Zoom every Sunday morning at 1030 and then later posted on Facebook and our website. After the service, we invite you to stay for a virtual coffee hour. You will be randomly sorted into breakout groups, and we hope that you'll stay and participate in this opportunity to connect with others. If you are worshiping with us for the first time today, we extend a special welcome to you. We hope that you will stay after the service and get to know us a little bit. We have two really important announcements this morning. First, our 2020 through 2021 religious education program is about to launch. Classes begin September 20th for kindergarten through 12th grade. Check out the BUC website for program descriptions and to register your kids, please register your kids. Also, we need your help spreading the word. If you know people that should know about this, please ask them to participate. Ask them to get in touch with religious education coordinator, Nico Van Ostrand with any questions. Secondly, homecoming Sunday is next week and this will include a virtual water communion. Everyone is invited to make a sign that has water droplets. Pictures of water droplets are in the shape of a water droplet with your answer to the prompt, I am, and then fill in the blank. Examples might include, I am hopeful, I am awesome, I'm a Unitarian Universalist. Take a photo of you and your sign and then send it to resident video wizard, Curtis Zatuna by this Thursday, September 10th. If you'd like your name to be on your sign, please write it on your sign before you take your photograph. You can see your weekly email update for more details on this. Again, thank you for joining us this morning or whenever you're watching this. Although we are not together physically, we are together in spirit, and it is good to be together again. And with that, our service will begin. We worship from our separate homes this morning and we are joined by a multitude of Unitarian Universalists and lighting our chalice. Our words today come from Florence Kaplow. In recognition of Labor Day, we light this flame to honor all work, including the work of our hands, hearts, and our backs. 
and gratitude for all the laborers, laborers that support our world and for all of those who boldly continue to work for justice, equality, and peace. We'll join now in our first hymn, We'll Build a Land. Let's lift our voices together. These opening words are adapted from a reading by the Reverend Megan Visser. We enter this meeting for kindness and comfort. May rough worn hands and aching backs be healed. We enter this meeting with hope for equality. May those who labor to survive live to know justice. We enter this meeting for love and vocation. May our bonds of solidarity be strengthened. We enter this meeting for courage and friendship. May we proceed hand in hand toward freedom. During this time of physical distance, I think we've all be become more aware of how important the relationships that we share are. The relationships in this community have deepened through our worship life, the continuation of our programs, and our many fellowship groups. We have found here a support system and a touchstone in a world unsettled. The care and stewardship of this community, physical or virtual, is in your hands. Unitarian Universalism is a free faith without a centralized authority. This is a privilege that we love and we revel in, but it is also a responsibility that we must take up solemnly. So let there be an offering of support for this beloved community and our good works. Contributions can be made now or later through our website or through Venmo with the username at BUCMI. You can also put a check in the mail to us. 
However you give, I invite you to give generously for the health of our community. We come now to the time in our service that we have set aside for spiritual practices such as prayer, reflection, song, and silence. We begin with a sharing of joys and sorrows from our community. We have one joy this week from Ray McCarris. Ray's birthday was on September 3rd and he writes, today is my 85th birthday. My joy is that I am still alive and in decent health. I invite you to move with me now deeper into a spirit of prayer and reflection. Weaver of life, spirit of creation, toil, beauty, strength. This morning we are mindful of those who have fought, those who have struggled, those who have suffered in an effort to bring justice to those who labor in this country. We think especially of those who are currently on the front line. We think of essential workers, those who are nurses and doctors, those who are emergency responders, and those who are sometimes, oftentimes overlooked, those who work in grocery stores, those who collect our garbage, those who do jobs that we don't even think of, things that we take for granted. May we be ever more mindful of the labor of others and the ways that we benefit from that labor May we be ever more mindful of our own labor and the joy that it brings to our lives and to others. May we keep in mind always the balance between labor, recreation, and rest. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. We'll spend time now together in silence. You know, it looks like we may have lost Morris. Oh, there we go.
In honor of Labor Day, I wrote this reflection about one of the early heroes of the labor rights movement. Mary Harris Jones, better known as Mother Jones, was a self-proclaimed hell-raising activist at the turn of the 20th century. Some called her the most dangerous woman in America. In 1903, Jones visited 75,000 striking textile workers in Kensington, Pennsylvania including 10,000 children. Many of them were under 12 years old, which at the time was the legal working age. Children worked more than 10 hours per day at a fraction of an adult worker's pay, often in brutal conditions. Many of the Kensington children had lost fingers or even hands to the textile machines. Mother Jones organized a group of these children for a weeks long march, a 130 mile journey from Philadelphia to Long Island, where President Theodore Roosevelt had his summer home. When they reached Coney Island, Mother Jones attracted a crowd by having the children stand in empty animal cages. To those people, she said, in Georgia, where children work day and night in the cotton mills, they have just passed a bill to protect songbirds. What about the little children from whom all song is gone? I will tell the president that the prosperity he boasts of is the prosperity of the rich, wrung from the poor and the helpless. Jones continued, the trouble is that no one in Washington cares. I saw our legislators in one hour pass three bills for the relief of the railways. But when labor cries for the aid for children, they will not listen. I asked a man in prison once how he happened to be there and he said, he had stolen a pair of shoes. I told him if he had stolen a railroad, he would be a United States Senator." End quote. Unfortunately, when the children arrived at Roosevelt's home, he refused to meet them. He claimed child labor was a state responsibility. Sadly, this Kensington strike failed, and those children were sent back to work. However, Jones celebrated the march as a success because it brought national attention and eventually led to real changes. Within two years, the Pennsylvania legislature increased the minimum working age to 14, prohibited night work for children, and added penalties for falsifying a child's age. Mother Jones concluded her autobiography by saying, the cause of the worker continues onward. Slowly, his hours are shortened, giving him leisure to read and to think. Slowly, the cause of his children becomes the cause of all. Slowly, those who create the wealth of the world are permitted to share it. The future is in labor's rough, strong hands." End quote. Mother Jones showed that ordinary citizens can become extraordinary leaders in the fight for social justice, but it's our fights too. Many of the issues she fought for, like fair wages, universal education, and safe working conditions still resonate in the 21st century. On this Labor Day, let us commit ourselves to keep fighting for a more just and fair society. Thank you for that reflection, Tom. I first encountered Mother Jones in my undergraduate education preparing for a career in social work. I was surprised that I had never heard of her before and like Tom, I find her a true inspiration. In fact, you'll hear a lot of Tom and I reflecting uh, back and forth because she's just so fascinating and there's just so much to be said about her. And she was barely five feet tall and she was known for wearing a lace collar and a black hat for most of her appearances. We have a couple of pictures of her I want to share with you this morning, just, just a few, although there are several. So you can see here that she, um, she has a certain look about her. And uh, it's kind of, uh, you know, unassuming, unintimidating, <laughs> which, is, which is not true about her at all. Um, in her later years, she wore those round, frameless spectacles that made her look matronly and also a little bit fierce. Here she is with that look, right? <laughs> the, 
that that look that makes you feel like maybe you should go clean your room or mow the lawn or something <laughs> not to be trifled with mother jones she lived to be almost 100 years old and she kept writing until she was about 80 uh, sometimes dictating to people with that that irish brogue and that look she very much resembled a lot of people's mamas or their grandmamas and honestly towards the end of her life and some of those images that's always how i've imagined mrs claus but behind that outward persona she was truly a force to be reckoned with at the time laborers were at the mercy of wealthy industrialists mills factories mines railroad plantations every industry where the burgeoning working class toiled benefited only the wealthy. Mother Jones was one of the most important champions of the rights of these laborers. She leveraged that motherly image to shame politicians and the affluent, most especially in her work to end the practice of child labor. I mean, could you imagine someone who looked like that marching through town with a parade of children who were starved and disabled due to poor working conditions? and then that parade marching up to your front lawn. Those tactics persuaded many a politician and industrialist to soften to the demands of labor unions. And before becoming known as Mother Jones, Mary Harris Jones experienced several hardships of her own. Her husband, an iron worker, had been active in the labor union movement himself. And after he and all of their children died in a yellow fever outbreak in 1876, Mother Jones's involvement with labor unions continued and it increased. She became a dressmaker in Chicago. She wrote about the extreme disparity in the wealth between the people for whom she sewed and the starving impoverished of the city whom often those wealthy people employed. She later said that those employers either did not notice or care about the stark contrast between the wealthy and the poor. Jones's home was destroyed in the Chicago fire of 1871. After that, she began moving around the country to support various labor movements. Should also be noted that for a period of time, she lived in Monroe, Michigan, where she was a teacher, which I, somewhere around here, I think. I think it should be noted that many of the most powerful women trailblazers in the United States history lived in Michigan at one point or another over the course of their lives, but I digress. She was given that nickname, Mother Jones, in January of 1897 after giving an address at a railway convention. The AFL-CIO estimates that tens of thousands of coal miners went on strike that summer. Mother Jones rallied these workers to participate in the strike and she provided them with support of various kinds in Pittsburgh. Her work was so effective in that strike that the mine workers union began to send her on field assignments to enroll new members and to agitate strikes throughout the country. Her unique angle on recruiting workers was to persuade their wives. One of the reasons that men were reluctant to join a labor union was the financial impact that strikes would have on their families and what would happen if they were unemployed because of being a part of those strikes. Mother Jones organized women to march in the streets, brandishing brooms and banging pots, chanting slogans about joining the union. With the support and perhaps insistence of their wives, more men felt emboldened to join unions and to participate in collective bargaining. Throughout her extraordinary career, she enjoyed many victories, but she is perhaps known for the march of the mill children, which Tom described in his reflection. At that time, 1903, there was no limit on the workday, no mandated time off or breaks, no regulation for the minimum working age, no no mandated minimum wage. It's true that technically the minimum age was 14, but it was uh, not often upheld. Most people working in factories, mills, etc., worked those 10 hour days, six days a week, and children worked the same hours as adults, including night shift, and they earned a far lower wage. Because of their small size and those conveniently lower wages, it was especially common for children to roll cigarettes, pick cotton, sell newspapers and do some of the most dangerous jobs in coal mines because they could fit into those small areas. 
And because they could fit into those small areas, they were considered ideal textile workers because of those little hands. They completed tasks like replacing empty industrial bobbins, mending broken threads. And as Tom mentioned, it was no secret then or now that that led to many injuries like lost fingers, lost limbs, smashed feet. In 1903, Tom and I turned up different numbers for this strike, but I found 100,000 silk workers went on strike to demand a reduction in hours down to a 55 hour work week. Among those strikers were what I found an estimated 16,000 children. Mother Jones organized 100 of them into a march from Philadelphia to Teddy Roosevelt's summer home in Long Island. When she asked the Philadelphia papers to cover the event, they declined because many of the newspapers were owned by mill workers. They had most of the stock in the newspapers. And she was reported to have replied, well, I have stock in these little children, so I'll arrange the publicity. And the entire march was filled with poignant moments like this and also the other ones that Tom shared in his reflection. President Roosevelt never met with the marchers, but they captured the mind and the hearts of the nation, eventually leading to reform of child labor laws. When we consider the influence Mother Jones had on American laws, it's important to remember that she did that without having the right to vote. The, ma the majority of her accomplishments happened before the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920. She often said, you don't need a vote to raise hell. Instead, she leveraged that matronly image and the plight of children, in other words, a generous dose of shame to advance the labor movement. And for that, she was, she was maligned. She was called the most dangerous woman in America, but she was also called the grandmother of all agitators. It was said of her that she would show up at a mine, crook her finger, and men would just walk out. Those were governmental officials that said all those things. She was arrested multiple times. She was denied outside contact while she was imprisoned. She was banned from several cities. She was even charged with a capital offense by a military tribunal, but that charge was later dismissed after public outcry. Labor organizers fought and they even died for the work schedule, which we now consider typical so often take for granted and complain about being too long. Robert Owen is widely credited with first proposing the eight hour workday. He believed that workers needed rest and recreation in order to be more productive, not because it was the right thing to do or a kind thing to do, but because he wanted to get a better product out of them. He suggested eight hours for work, eight hours for recreation and eight hours for rest. That eight hour workday became a primary goal of the American labor movement. It was strongly opposed by industrialists, but enough pressure was put on Congress to create labor standards. The passage of the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 was a turning point for American workers, sort of. Antiquated FLSA exemptions for agricultural workers still allows for children to work long hours in dangerous conditions estimated up to 72 hours a week in the United States right now in our agricultural industry. That applies especially to migrant children. Other workers' rights have been slowly and relentlessly diluted. Corporations are endlessly creative in taking advantage of the working poor. And of course, legal rights only apply to legal citizens. The success of the early labor rights movement may not be complete, but it should not be diminished. Many of us are familiar with Eugene B. Debs, Samuel Gompers, and their work championing the rights of workers juxtaposed with the villainy of people like John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie. We know the names of Debs and Gompers because of their success in securing labor rights. But they could not have done that work without Mother Jones giving hope to the unions, without her pulling at the heartstrings of our nation. Laws without people being behind them are rarely successful. Her ability to persuade people 
through the Hearts and Mind campaign is what made those labor laws come into being. Mother Jones said a lot of outrageous and memorable things. She really mastered the art of the soundbite about a hundred years before anybody ever used that phrase. And we have one more image to show you today. This is an icon uh, made by um, contemporary Franciscan friar Robert Lentz. Her slogan was pray for the dead and fight like hell for the living. And that's what's written on that scroll. Pray for the dead, fight like hell for the living. Our nation's experience of the COVID pandemic has once again placed the disparities between the wealthy and the working poor in stark contrast. We have been reminded how much we depend upon those who do the least glamorous, most dangerous work in our nation. And we are called again to pray for the dead and to fight like hell for the living. On Labor Day, we pause to consider the value of our labor and the labor of others. Labor Day is a remembrance of the brutality of past working conditions and a critical inquiry of the working conditions of our time. It is a celebration of the contributions of Mother Jones and other labor organizers to tell their stories, the work that they did to create a more fair and equitable relationship between those who control the means of labor and the workers, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat classes, if you will. In a capitalist society, we must be ever vigilant of this power dynamic and continue to agitate for fair working conditions. Otherwise, the wealthy will always stand on the back of the poor. That work, the work of Mother Jones and so many others has been handed to us. This Labor Day, may we be found equal to the task. And it is in that spirit, I invite you now to join in our closing hymn, Building a New Way. Let us raise our voices together in singing. Go now out into this world, this world that so easily slips into inequality and into oppression. Take with you the memory and the hope of Mother Jones, the fierceness, the feistiness, the undauntedness of Mother Jones and work for a more fair and equitable working environment for all. May it be so. Amen and blessed be. <laughs>